Okay, on the onset here, I need to make one thing clear. This morning, earlier, and even this afternoon, we're, we're, we've been speaking of the National Academy of Science study as if it's a done deal that the National Academy of Sciences will do this project. It's very likely they will. However, we have federal acquisition regulations. National Academy of Sciences is a not-for-profit institution a private entity. So it's not as simple as doing an interagency agreement with another government agency because they are not. We published a synopsis for the job that we want done, and I'll get to the points and the questions that we want whoever does this study to answer in a moment. But we published a synopsis in January in FedBiz, our government website, to advertise for these kinds of things. And if other entities are interested and qualified to do this study, they will be considered also. However, National Academy of Sciences completed uh, three previous studies, and we're pretty much under the assumption that they probably are the best qualified to do this job. But again, it's not a done deal. <coughs> National Academy of Sciences was created in 1863 by Congressional Charter. Actually, uh, President Lincoln signed that. They're an official and independent advisor to the federal government in the matters of science and technology. And the National Academy of Science should be well qualified for this because they're organized to gain participation by scientists around the world. Uh, they have a record of being impartial and objective in their studies. They have a history of bringing together experts to address issues that involve very different points of view. And we certainly have that in management of the Wild Horse and Bull program. So, what is it that we are asking whoever does this study to do? We want an independent technical analysis. We want them to review the three previous <coughs> reports conducted by the National Academy of Sciences, one in 1980, one in 1982, and one in 1991. <coughs> we want them to review, as Dr. Kane said earlier, the relevant research conducted since the last report. And we also will ask them, and we have in the synopsis, to identify any new research that they feel is important that would benefit the management of the Wild Horse and Burrow program. So what are the key questions that need to be answered? Key questions will answer some of the controversy and the very different points of view about this program's management. Population estimation. Given available, here, here's what's in the synopsis. And I'm going to go through this because I think the audience is interested. And I think I can stay within the timeline. Given available information and methods, how accurately can wild horse and burrow populations in the West be estimated? What are the best methods to estimate wild horse and burrow herd numbers? And what is the margin of error uh, uh, in those methods? Are there better techniques than BLM currently uses to estimate population numbers? For example, could genetics or remote sensing using unmanned aircraft be used to estimate population size and distribution? Genetic diversity. What does, inf what does information available in on wild horse and burrow herds genetic diversity indicate about long-term herd health from a biological and genetic perspective. Is there an optimal level of genetic diversity within a herd to manage for? What management actions could be undertaken to achieve an optimal level of genetic diversity if it's too low? Third question, annual rates of wild horse and burrow population growth. BLM recognizes there's various rates of annual increase. Generally, for budgeting and planning purposes, we use 20%. However, this question is posed to whoever does this study. Estimate the annual rates of annual 
increase in wild horse and burrow herds, including factors affecting the accuracy of and uncertain uncertainty related to these estimates. Is there compensatory reproduction as a result of gathers to remove wild horse and burrow excess numbers or application of PZP22 over a four-year gather cycle? And if so, what is the level of compensatory reproduction? Would wild horse and burrow populations self-limit if they were not controlled? And if so, what indicators would be present at the point of self-limitation? Indicators like what would the range look like? What would the range conditions be? What would animal health and animal condition be? <coughs> Fourth question, population modeling. BLM uses a population model called Win Equus. Uh, a question posed to the study would be is, Evaluate the strengths and limitations of the Win Equus population model for predicting impacts on wild horse populations given, as, given various stochastic factors and management alternatives. Fifth question regarding predator management. Evaluate information relative to the abundance of predators and their impact on wild horse and burrow populations. Is there evidence that predators alone could effectively control wild horse burrow population size in the West? Sixth question, population control. What scientific factors should be considered when making population control decisions relative to the effectiveness of, con of the control approach, herd health, genetic diversity, social behavior and animal <coughs> well-being. Population control decisions being roundups, fertility control, sterilization of either males or females, sex ratio adjustments, or other population control measures. Immunocontraception of wild horse mares. Evaluate the information related to the effectiveness of immunocontraception in preventing pregnancies and reducing herd populations. Are there other fertility control agents or population control methods the BLM should consider for either mares or stallions? Appropriate management level establishment or adjustment. We're not asking the National Academy of Sciences or any other entity doing this study whether there's too many cows and not enough horses or too many horses and not enough other multiple uses, what we are asking them to do is evaluate BLM's approach to establishing or adjusting AML as described in our 47-1 handbook. And are there other approaches to establishing or adjusting AML the BLM should consider? How might BLM improve its ability to validate appropriate management levels? So, in summary here, I think some of these questions have been answered earlier, but it's proposed to begin this study the spring of 2011, conclude it the spring of 2013, two years from now, and the estimated cost, final cost won't be in until we have someone to contract with and final negotiations are completed, but uh, Renee asked the question earlier, about 1.3 million for two years of study, 650,000 annually. So, may I answer questions? Renee. Is my understanding correct that this is to look at the existing body of literature and BLM's methods and make evaluations based on that? We're not asking NAS to do any new research. That's correct. They do not do research. <coughs> uh, their assignment here is to review the literature and determine if we're using and applying the best available. research available, the best science available. <coughs> and in addition, as I mentioned, that we might, one of the questions is what other kinds of research should be conducted uh, to answer questions that are not answered in the existing literature. Dean, will this be funded out of the horse program or will it be a BLM? It'll funded? be funded out of the horse program, Gary. 
Wild Horse and Borough Money. And as a follow-up to Renee's question, um, what you, you talked about the um, reviewing prior reports and analysis and then identifying new research needs. How much of their, I guess, their time and what we'd be paying for will they be spending on the review of what's, what's already been done compared to what is new? I mean, do you know how this is going to break down? Uh, no, I don't. I think the majority of their time will be reviewing existing literature that's, that's published. Uh, and then based on their read and evaluation of all that and the questions we've asked them, they probably will point out, well, you, need to know, you want to know about this, but it's not in the literature, so here's some research you might consider doing to answer this important question or add to the body of knowledge already published. But that's up to the team that's, that's looking at yeah, it. Yeah, it's up to NAS. It's not to BLM. I was just going to add, I guess I was thinking, since um, there have been three previous NAS NRC reports. Um, and while none of us here are going to be able to dictate, as Vernon points out, you know what exactly they're going to be looking at, but do you anticipate they'll be looking? I mean, if you take if you pick up the 1980 one, a lot of ex we're going to be talking about the same things. And it seems to me that perhaps, and I don't mean to anticipate what they might say, but um, I would imagine some of it is going to be this was brought up in 1980 and the last couple reports and why or, or how were these not followed up on? I mean, I would, is, do, you, uh, do you anticipate that that'll be a portion of the, the final report? Because it's not, this isn't something new. And yes, science does change a little bit. Um, but some of the, I mean, if you read the, well, I know you've read them. There, there's not a lot of different, the <coughs> items that you put on the, the screen for the bullets, they're basically pretty much the same. Uh, to a large degree they are. Um, and to a large degree the old reports talked about all the public controversy and it might not exactly be ever be resolvable. Um, how, do, how, is there anything that BLM can do um, to I'm anticipating way down the line that this report comes out and we're sitting, I don't know, 10 years from now wanting another NAS study. Um, well, we've already been through that. I'm not, I'm not discrediting that we need one. Um, I'm just trying to um, understand how it will be, how it may be received differently. Well, I'm not sure about what the public will think about how they'll receive it. Um, I think the Bureau feels that we do need this review and in the meantime we're not going to sit still and not do anything. Maybe that's really kind of what you're hinting at here. Are we just going to sit here and wait oh, for no, the no, study? No, 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 I know. I'm, I'm aware that, you know, life goes on and we'll, we'll the BLM will be, you know, pr pursuing certain elements of, of it, of the program. I guess my concern is we've been here. I wasn't here in 1980, um, but um, but I we had the reports, um, and I'm just trying to see how things are going to be different. Well, I'm not sure about that, but the public has called for this study. Congress has hinted, not right. hinted, they have indicated that they think we should do this study. So. How are things going to be different? I think there will be some new findings. We're calling on experts from throughout the world and maybe there's innovations in Australia or other places that could be helpful. And maybe that's more How are things going to be different? I don't think I can tomorrow. answer that question. Uh, right, I understand, but maybe that's more of a question for tomorrow in terms of the strategy. You know, were the other three reports looked at to help determine because we don't, there are some areas we, there, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to add you know, further good science, but a lot of these things are going to be repetitive. Well, I don't, right. I would guess the NAS or whoever does this study won't spend a lot of time 
on things that have already been covered and covered in their three reports adequately, if there's nothing to add to it, then they can focus on the other areas. Okay. I think there's 20 years of literature to review here yeah. for the science portion of it, yes. That's probably the answer to the question that I didn't get to, Renee. Thank you. That, that, that I see is a very valid f portion of it because there has, it has been a while before since we've had the last <coughs> report. But in terms of the, the bullet points that we went through, many of them are the same. They are. Robin? Same yes. controversies. Don't you think, you know, the controversy is going to be obviously the same. Same issues will come up. And probably a lot of the information in the science, you know, that relates to rangeland health and those probably have not changed significantly over that period of time. I think where we might see some new evaluation is in the research that's being done on the immunocontraception. Right and those matters that are actively being researched now. And so, I'd, in fact, is it maybe, maybe it's, it's, it's a, you know, affirmation of what's being done to see, to go back and relook at that science and say, you know, maybe what we're doing is not, the, the, you know, is absolutely appropriate, and you may turn around and say that it's not. But you need that, occasionally you need that refresh look at, at it, what the science is saying, because we all talk about the best science, and I think we have to relook at it in order to do that. So it's even the OIG has called, you know, is has directed you to do that. So I think it's I think it's the right thing to do, and I I, I share your concern. Right. Are we going to have anything different? But we need that fresh look. Correct. And it, you're right. It does. It will serve as an affirmation for some of the things that are moving in the right direction. Any other questions regarding the National Academy of Science? Then the last item on our agenda uh, for the afternoon is the, Dean, you were going to talk about the report and the recommendations. Uh, yes, and I got five minutes to do it. I'm going to take a few more minutes if I might indulge the board. Uh, before I get to this report, though, uh, I would like to mention several things that are along the same lines and in the spirit of, of outside independent review of our program. Um, BLM invited the American Association of Equine Practitioners to review the handling and care of our horses. Um, that was done about four or five, six months ago, five months ago, no matter. A team of nine veterinarians have been selected and they've reviewed, been, uh, been out in the field and visited three gathers. They've been to several short-term holding facilities and just recently they visited long-term holding facilities. And we, re we expect their report this summer. So it's another outside, not controlled by BLM, uh, look at our handling and care of horses at gather short-term holding and long-term holding. So we're anxious to receive that report this summer. Also, uh, something Carla is going to mention, but it's apropos to uh, what we're talking about here. When Director Abbey announced the proposed strategy uh, nearly two weeks ago, he pledged to conduct a thorough review and add appropriate controls to contracts and policies to strengthen humane animal care and handling practices. Um, the AAEP look at our program is along those lines and the, re the uh, review and look at gathers uh, was exactly in the spirit of what Director Abbey said. So let's get into this independent designated observer pilot program. And you have the final report in your books. Uh, it was offered to BLM by the American Horse Protection Association as a pilot program in June 2010. AHPA engaged four independent credentialed professionals who are academic-based equine veterinarian and equine specialists uh, from four different universities. Uh, 
teams of two went out to the field and visited three gathers for a period of three to four days. They had an evaluation checklist that they developed that included looking at gather activities, horse handling during the gather, horse description, and temporary holding facilities. I'm just going to kind of go right through the report and highlight some <coughs> of the observations. And then there are 18 recommendations. Uh, some of those BLM has begun to act on. We have not developed a final response to the independent observer report and the 18 recommendations, but we'll consider those along with those from AH, uh, AE, AAEP, getting late in the afternoon, okay. and I, any I other kind of reviews that we might initiate of our program. I was program. just going to suggest in the interest of time that you might want to concentrate on the recommendations. I think most of the folks on the board have read the report. Well, and yeah. it's been posted on the website. <coughs> I think it's the response to the, recommend, the recommendations and the response, and a response if you at that point yet. Well, there are 18 recommendations, and as I said, we have not responded formally to them. Would you like me to review the recommendations, or would you like you me? Want to go by the, each recommendation? Would you like me just to? mention a few things that we've done that are, that are mentioned in the recommendations or go over all of them? I th you probably need, if you go over one, you need to go over each of the recommendations. <coughs> or at least the ones that you've acted on. Or We'd um, like to, for the board would like um, all of the recommendations to go through. Okay. That's why I wanted to just shorten the time without the the observation, because this has been posted. Well, maybe we have to pick this up tomorrow. <laughs> well, I think we, we have a pretty full it. day yeah. tomorrow, and I will move through quickly. I won't read the whole of each recommendation, but I will read the main point of all 18. The first is, if at all possible, horses should not be roped or tied down in recumbent position for prolonged periods of time. Uh, we do have contract stipulations that apply to roping, but that will certainly be one of the things that we will be reviewing and that the AAEP might comment on, and we have a few months to do that before the gather season starts, and we may have a lot of months to do that if we don't have additional funding. If I could just ask folks in the audience to hold your chat until 10 minutes or 5 minutes from now so we could get this done. Okay. Next one, excessively aggressive horses, studs or mares, should be isolated as soon as possible or grouped with horses they were with before capture. More of an effort, next one, more of an effort should be made to ensure that horses enter the short sorting chute face forward. Another suggestion is to make the chute progressively darker over the course of several dozen feet using tighter woven snow fence, which would still allow an advanced chance to determine the gender of animals. Um, initially, uh, things began to be changed by the contractors by adding more snow fence, but Sun Jay contractor actually came up with a pretty good idea that we think will be a good improvement. Uh, could somebody help me, please? Here we go. Um, in place of the snow fence in some of these pressure points, we don't need to roll it all out, but instead of hanging the plastic snow fence that has holes in it and tends to be crinkly and rattly, we think this innovation is better. When you look at it from an angle, it has a very solid appearance, which probably means animals would have a lesser tendency to challenge them. But if you're a wrangler here and the chute is here, you can see pretty much right through it and be able to sex animals, be able to judge their movement and shoot in this, their mm -hmm. movement in the chute. And we think this is going to be pretty cool. So we have some prototypes that we've tried. Uh, they were in place on the antelope gather. And we'll continue to test that and see what the best answer to this question is. 
The next recommendation wa is consider widening gate areas leading to chutes and alley to afford more than one horse to move on. Work more slowly even in rescue scenarios. Another recommendation, thick padding should be placed on the rails above the gates overhead. Uh, visitors to the gathers have recommended that the overhead bars be covered <coughs> with padding because they were contact with those bars was causing facial injuries. Uh, there was in assertions that they were causing a lot of deaths, these uncovered bars. Well, that's not exactly true. I don't think, except at short-term only, I don't think we've had a gather-related death related to contact with an overhead bar. It's kind of a spreader bar over the gate. It's there for bracing and keeping the integrity of the gate. Uh, at Twin Peaks Gather, actually, Tim, I think you were on that gather, there was a lot of suggestion that that really ought to be done. Uh, I think you visited with the contractor, uh, yep, the couture and they padded roundup the, they and padded livestock. The, gates, the, the walls of the head gates to help yeah. reduce orbital injuries. So what they did is they went to town and they got um, uh, foam Pipe. insulation that's yeah. for keeping pipes from freezing. That didn't work out very well. It was not very durable, but it was a good start. Since that time, uh, this prototype was tested at Antelope. They have Velcro strips on it. Uh, this isn't exactly what's tested, but there's a thicker piece of uh, padding in here uh, surrounded with Cordurva nylon that has been sewn to encase it. So you have a long tube of this that can be wrapped around the bars and then secured with Velcro works a lot better than the electrical tape that yep. they were using on the foam yeah, insulation. Yeah, well they were trying to sort something out just to, they were really being, I found them to be very responsive to the suggestion of doing something there, so this is really nice to see that. Well, our contractors are concerned about the well-being for the horses, and... I, I, f I, f I concur with that. I found them to be <coughs> extremely willing to do Make the make some changes in that regard. They were they, he embraced the concept. In fact, his exact words were when I asked him about doing that. Um, there were several of the uh, of, uh, other people there, um, adv some advocates there that had asked specifically to make that change. And I volunteered to approach Mr. Couture with it. And his exact words <coughs> were that let those ladies know I won't run another horse through this chute until I pad the gates. And he stopped what he was doing, sent some people into town and got the padding and did it. So I just, you know, just to see any kind of motion in a positive direction, <coughs> I applaud. I don't care who's doing it. But it well. was nice to see. And the ladies that had asked for that then went out of their way, sought Mr. Couture out and thanked him for doing that. <coughs> and I think it was a nice, it was a, a good thing to see two groups that have been doing this work together if, if it was just for a couple hours. And as I think it's an, in, indicative of the direction that I think this process can go in if people, people work together. And I think I applaud the advocates that took a reasonable approach to the request. I applaud the BLM for allowing me to do that. I applaud the Couture's for embracing it and doing it. And I think that needs to be recognized. Well, the contractors are willing to, to change I, that's, that's and do business differently. and. Yep. Sometimes it kind of takes an outside look to point things out that may not be tremendously obvious to those that are involved. So that's what Director Abbey's commitment is, is that <coughs> we take a good look at all these things. And we'll be meeting with the contractors, and we may involve some independent outside. We are going to involve more independent mm -hmm. outside people. So we're looking forward to how we can improve these things. These are just a couple of the small things that are already being done. Uh, next recommendation, the height of the outside fence panels of the temporary holding facility for stud pens should be raised from 6 feet to 7 feet to d discourage rearing or jumping over and sustain sustaining po possible injuries. Next recommendation, railings where horses will be herded past should be kept free of all hanging items such as jackets or other apparel to avoid spooking the animals. Short-term holding facilities with wire fencing, example, Litchfield should be transitioned to steel rail livestock panels
to improve safety and security factors for fencing. There has been a number of panels installed at Litchfield. Uh, steel fencing replaced the netting wire fences. Uh, that facility had not been upgraded because based on a previous study, assuming that we were nearly at appropriate management level and that we'd be decreasing the number of animals removed from the range, there was a <coughs> suggestion in this evaluation that we would be decommissioning Litchfield. So it really wasn't up to the state of the art that some of our other fil facilities are, but changes have been made there in reference to this recommendation. Next recommendation. All corrals should be re remain free from trash and baling twine to prevent digestive tract problems as well as an injury resulting in entangling twine. Uh, BLM hasn't responded to any of these, but some of these are just no-brainers and um, we feel that attention d is being paid to this stuff, but apparently not always. Next recommendation, horses held in any enclosure over four hours after a gathering at a trap site should be provided with access to hay and water in at least 100 gallon containers unless the horses are seriously dehydrated and compromised and in the opinion of the veterinarian should have restricted access to reduce the risk of water intoxication. Um, we do have pretty good provisions for providing water to the horses, the full pens the pens for foals at the trap site do get water. Uh, there's at least two drinking tanks already in the pens at temporary sorting and holding. So I'm not sure if the suggestion here is for bigger containers or if their observation was they're not being watered after four hours. But again, I guess I'm not here to respond to these things at this moment. The next recommendation, lidocaine spray or other topical anesthetic should be utilized by attending veterinarians in order to facilitate suturing of wounds in horses in the squeeze chute. I don't think I've heard of that kind of uh, agent, but that's something uh, that we've asked veterinarians to look into. Boyd could probably comment on that. Next recommendation, transport and of animals should be kept to a minimum. That means unloading and loading to minimize those events. All right, we've got five more to go. Next one, public observers and increased BLM personnel should be limited in the number and activity and proximity to the trap in order to not hinder the least resistant pathway of movement and minimize the distance traveled of the horses into the trap area necessary for a successful gather. Next recommendation. Prohibit parked vehicles in direct sight of horses moving toward the trap site and corrals. Next one. Consider instituting a lottery system to limit the number of public observers in order to ensure that distractions to horses being gathered to allow for the safe handling of the animals as they move toward the trap and corrals. Next recommendation, consider installing camera monitors in the chutes, corrals at short-term holding facilities or trap sites for the public to observe gathering, loading, unloading, and preparation of the animals. The public could watch at the short-term holding facilities and not, be additionally, and not be additionally stressful to the animals. Last recommendation, consider mounting a wide-angle lens camera on the helicopter during gather gathers to record movement and behavior of horses to study the effects of the helicopter on the horses. So I believe I covered all 18 recommendations. We have done quite a bit of research into some of these as to feasibility to implement and cost, and I'm just not prepared to report on those to you today. But we will submit a formal response to AHEP. And uh, can I answer any questions? I just tried to deliver the contents of the report. It is what it is. And the recommendations are what they are. The only question I had was um, outside of the HPA and AEP, uh, my understanding is BLM is open to other organizations. <coughs> 
submitting similar like pilot programs with regard to the care of the horses? Well, in the spirit of Director Abby's announcement of a couple of weeks ago, I don't think there's much off the table. We are particularly interested in partnerships, which you just alluded to, and he, as I indicated earlier, uh, we are going to conduct a review of our program and <coughs> contract stipulations and policies in regards to animal handling and health. The animal welfare component of the strategy that Carla will talk about tomorrow <coughs> is something we are moving out on and that is in very, very important to the program. Dean, if it's a pilot program, um, what, what's going to happen? I mean, is there a plan for a BLM to continue with the, the independent designated observer? I mean, I know they made recommendations and you're considering which of those to implement, but in terms of continuing the concept of having observers, uh, what, what are you going to do? Well, the concept of observers that are independent of BLM might help create greater trust than we would have with, with some interest. Uh, partnerships are a good way to do that, and will we continue this particular one? It was a pilot. Uh, we've got some results. Uh, <coughs> we've got AEP's study coming in, and uh, yeah, I think uh, independent evaluation of our performance and how we handle and care for the animals is uh, something we're interested in in the future. We want to do a good job, and we're, we're open to having people evaluate our performance. Do you, do you think professional accredited individuals. Do you think, Dean, that there needs to be some criteria set though to what determines whether they are a trained observer? Should do I feel that some criteria should be set to assure there are trained observers? Yeah. And I think that alluded to my comment that accredited uh, professional experts in these kind of matters are the kind of folks that we're interested in reviewing our performance and making recommendations for improvement. And that's not to say the public has not had good ideas. They have. Just like the pads on the bars. <coughs> Something that we didn't have for years and it's a pretty easy thing to fix. Are there any other questions? I'd like to get a comment. I, I think this is I think this has been a, a, a good exercise. I, I, you know, I really applaud the, the effort that was made here to pick out four individuals who are equine specialists from varying parts of the country. And other than the one from California, they were from areas that really have, they are totally independent of the politics and, and, the, and the conflict going on with wild horses, you know, in the West. So I, you know, and, and to see professionals give their opinions, and there are some very good recommendations here in my mind. You know, some, like you say, a lot of them are no-brainers and would be considered tweaking of the program, but I think by and large, a lot of these reviews that we've had, when you're concerned with animal health and animal welfare, during this process have been, in general, pretty positive toward the current function and procedure that's going on. You know, I, I think the, the uh, Office of the Inspector General gave a, a very, you know, positive, you know, view of, of the humane treatment of animals. Uh, this group, in my mind, has recommendations, but had a generally favorable view of the entire process. And we'll wait and see what the, the group from the equine practitioners will have to say. But it, at some point we have to accept, you know, we, we, along with having these things done, we have to sit back and accept what they've what they've told us. And too often we tend to, you know, the GAO report, it's, it's, it's provided and then it's set aside and forgotten. The OIG report is, is presented and set aside. This one's presented and will probably be set aside and forgotten. We need to remember what, what things are actually said and recommended in, in these types of reports. But I, I think this has been a very good exercise and I think you know, more of it would be, would be a, a positive. <coughs> thing. Well, again, I think there's always room for improvement, there's always new technology, there's always better ideas. Um, what parts of this report that I, and, and we're willing to endorse those and, and get after it and change things where, where it'll be positive to do that. 
The parts of this report I didn't review, six other pages, you kind of alluded to it, really did indicate that the practices of the helicopter, the handling of the horses, are done in a good manner. Uh, there was indications in there that the handling practice, the handlers are aware of um, the, flight the flight zone of the horses and the pressure points and that they did practice techniques uh, recommended by Temple Grandin, who's kind of a recognized expert in animal handling. But along with, you know, recognizing the recommendations for change, I think we also have to give due recognition to the comments made that were positive in, in the way things are being done. We can't forget that, you know, we can't minimize that portion of, the, of these types of reports. Well, and also I would think that, you know, any evaluation, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing process. You know, it might be these four observers during these, these three gathers. Um, it might be, you know, three other um, veterinarians um, at other gathers, you know, AEPs doing, you know, a, a little bit more um, comprehensive review uh, to include not only the gathers, but long and short term holding. And I think that they're trying to get to an adoption. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing process. Self evaluation always, always is. You bet. You plan, you execute, you evaluate, and you change, and you execute some more and reevaluate. I guess uh, I've been around a long time, not nearly as long as some people in the program, but there are many people who say that there's no one in the world that has more experience in capturing and handling wild horses than the Bureau of Land Management. That's probably true. We've been doing this since uh, the early 70s before we were authorized to use helicopters, uh, gathering horses horseback, which was not very effective. Then we got authorization. Well, I'll comment on horseback gathers. You know, they weren't very effective. I've ridden on some horseback gathers, and I was a darn poor horse catcher. I was pretty young at the time with not much experience, and I was just along with the crew. The more successful times that I've read about uh, in books uh, involve techniques where airplanes would herd the horses and move them around uh, to get them tired and sometimes sore-footed, and horsemen on the ground without airplanes would follow the horses for days until they could become manageable. I don't think that's necessarily the best practice, and I think helicopters are a better practice. When we started using helicopters in 1978, there has been a, a progression of change and improvement in gather techniques during 1978 to present. That's 30-some uh, that's years where we have evolved and de developed better and better practices. Uh, it involves the experience in how to handle the horses once they're in the trap. It involves how to capture them, the wing construction, longer wings instead of shorter wings. It involves the snow fence that now might become the this, this see-through fabric I told you about. When we didn't have snow fence, the horses challenged the fences with much greater frequency. Somebody thought of that. That's probably the gather contractors. That was an improvement. Uh, we had one water trough in a pen instead of two. When you had uh, a number of horses in a pen, you got some dominant ones, they get all the water. Well, somebody suggested putting two water troughs in the pen so that the horses can easily get water. The horses are fed all around the edge so that they can, uh, all of them have better access when they're being held at temporary holding facilities. My point is, is that there has been evaluation and improvement progressively and positively over time, and the Bureau is still, as we've talked, open to further evaluation and certainly open to improve anything that would improve our care and handling and the animal welfare. So I think that's all I have to say, and thank you, and I'm sorry I took too long this Any afternoon. Any other questions? Did we want to take um, just a minute. Yeah, I agree with your assessment. Things have, we've, I've been in this, involved in this for a long damn time, and the program has improved over the years, and it's a damn good one. 
Well, we're not perfect. Mistakes are made, but we're willing to change some more.